You are looking at extraordinary breaking news. We are in court live in Madison, Wisconsin, talking about a case involving dogs, beagles, who are in a laboratory breeding beagle facility. And there is, um, we just lost that signal, but we'll try to get it back. Um, let's just show you the dogs who are at the very center of this. Uh, this is courtesy Direct Action Everywhere. Um, Direct Action Everywhere, way back in 2017 with Wayne Shung, as you see him walking in, went into this uh, laboratory breeding beagle facility and documented what they said were cruel conditions. You can see the dog in the bottom spinning below. We believe that that is one of the three dogs um, that were taken there, rescued by those uh, animal activists, but they were charged with felony theft and burglary. This was seven years ago. And um, they were going to go on trial just a, a few days before the trial was supposed to start. Remember, this video was filmed in 2017, and it took a long time, a long time for the case to come to trial the three dogs were taken to veterinarians and they were placed in good homes. Seven years later, Wayne Shung is set to go on trial along with two co-defendants facing the possibility of 16 years in prison. And all of a sudden, um, they dropped the charges. And so Wayne Shung, who could have faced 16 years in prison, it turns out, wow, he doesn't have to worry about that at all. You'd think most people would be happy, but it turns out he was very disappointed. So he went back to court today to demand that a special prosecutor be appointed in order to um, investigate and launch a case against the Beagle Breeding Facility. We were in court and... Um, okay, uh, he's saying turn off the noise. Okay, please rejoin. Um, we're doing this for the very first time, so you're seeing sort of history in the making. I will make sure that when he rejoins, I will make sure that we are muted, that we are muted when you rejoin. Uh, so just join and join and we will get to you, go to you. Okay, so uh, while he's rejoining, hopefully, we're going to just give you a little backstory on this. Um, this is historic case. You think most people, right? Oh, they're not going to go to prison for um, all these years. They're thrilled. Well, Wayne was disappointed. We're going to go back into court now. There he is. I'm going to mute. What I want to do is talk about what that's going to look like. So my first question is, how much time do you need to prepare for the hearing, meaning when do you want to set it, and how much time of the court's time do you need to present it? Can we talk just a minute to consult with one another? Your Honor, I think about a month and a half, so late May, early June would work well for us. Um, we just want to check with a couple of the witnesses who would be key witnesses in the evidentiary hearing uh, to make sure that they don't have any you know, difficult conflicts around that time. And we also don't think it would take more than a day, so I think if we could just have a, a proceeding, uh, I don't think we, yeah, as I said, I don't think we need more than a day for the, for the hearing. Thank you. 
Um, Judy Ozan, I didn't mean to, uh, that the district attorney is also here. Um, Judy Ozan, is there anything you wish to state? Um, you're entitled to be at the hearing of the statute uh, before I set this up. Coming with that now. Thank you. All right, so let's look at the dates. And June's going to probably work better for the court. How about Wednesday, June 19th, starting at 9 a.m.? Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, that's a county holiday now. It's June 8th day, so that's what we're June 25th at 9 a.m. I think it works for us because we're just checking quickly with the witnesses. Your Honor, I actually have to be in court in Alameda County on that day. I have a, a pre trial hearing that's already been scheduled. Yeah. Friday, June 28th. I think it's the weekend before 4th of July, so I don't know if that's anyone's holiday plans. We can, if, we, if we can't do it that day, we'll have to push it up to July. That day won't work for me. <laughs> Wednesday, July 10th. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just checking with our expert at nine very quickly. She is on the chat with me right now. <clears throat> but it doesn't like to work for us. That's not how it's July 10th should be fine for our, for our witnesses. All right, let's start at 9 o'clock on July 10th. Um, by June 28th, I would like the petitioner to file a pretrial brief. And in that pretrial brief, I would like you to set forth the statutes that you believe are violated, the criminal statutes by which I want you to summarize the evidence that you believe I will be hearing to support those charges. And I would also like the pre-trial submission to include the names of your witnesses and just a brief summary of their expected testimony. I would also like you to bring me on the day of the hearing a paper copy of your exhibits. It's difficult. Uh, current system is having, has been having a few glitches about e-filing exhibits um, and we just mark them as we go that day. So we won't have any pre-marked or any pre-filing of exhibits, but I would like a copy to look at while you're presenting them to your witnesses and we will mark them that day. Do you have any questions on the uh, procedure or anything else you wish to address today? Your Honor, one, one thing I wanted to check with you on, the procedure here is obviously unusual because this is a novel procedure. So in my review of the Wisconsin statutes, it seems we do have authority to issue a subpoena duces tecum, and I think we would like to, just very narrow in scope, issue a, a number of subpoenas to a small number of witnesses. And I wanted to inquire with the court as to the appropriate return date. I think we have to give anyone who is subpoenaed 10 days under chapter 805 section 7 june 28th would seem like a reasonable return date for an sdt but I've, given that this is an unusual proceeding i wanted to check with your honor first before we through miss frank issued any subpoenas yes june 28th should be fine they don't give us a recent uh, 968 up to 
hearing in the county uh, where there was a hearing. I don't know what the procedure that was used in that hearing, but I can also check with my colleague, Judge Trammell, who presented over that hearing and see how they, whether they handled it any differently, but I think that's probably appropriate. Understood. Thank you, Ron. Anything else? Uh, one last thing. Uh, one of the letters that was added to the amended petition, uh, I think during the confession of the PDF seems to have been it's blurred. And so we have a physical copy here if we could leave that with the court as well. Well, why don't you bring it if you're going to submit it in evidence when you have your hearing? I've received a number of okay. uh, emails to my court account. Uh, people have been writing letters to um, the branch that the branch has been getting. I have not read them because, like I said, the next party communications. I've given all of those to our clerk of court, who is preserving them for record keeping purposes. So I'm not going to take anything ex parte in the form of a letter of someone who's not a petitioner. But you, if that person is testifying or you wish to submit it as additional evidence on the hearing date, I will look at it that time. All right, thank you, Mark. And just, you know, for, to advise um, any of your supporters or detractors, frankly, um, I am not going to be reviewing requests uh, from people who are not petitioners in this case or I'm not going to be considering outside um, outside submissions uh, in my decision. My decision is going to be made at the time that I hear the evidence and I'm going to consider uh, things outside of what petitioners are presenting. Okay? Anything else today? Uh, nothing for me, Your Honor. No, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all for coming today, and I will see you on July 10th. If you need anything in the interim, just contact my clerk in terms of if you need hearing dates. Uh, if there if there's small matters that you have questions about, we can always do those um, by Zoom if that's helpful to you in terms of uh, your time and court's time. I won't make you all come down here for a five minute hearing, uh, but I did want to see you all today just so that. You can have this conversation in person. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Wow. This is history. You are watching history in the making. Animal activists going into court uh, demanding uh, that there be a special prosecutor appointed to investigate this uh, beagle breeding facility and to give you the backstory once again by the way we should be hearing from wayne shung any minute now you can see him there in court uh, walking around and uh, we'll just stay on this picture as you see obviously there he is with his legal team and uh, once he gathers his belongings and goes outside we will be able to talk to him hopefully uh, but uh, this is happening in Madison, Wisconsin. Remember, Wayne Shung, the gentleman you're looking there uh, at there in the middle, was supposed to go on trial. I mean, he was facing 16 years in prison for felony burglary and theft for going into Ridgeland Farms. And we invite Ridgeland Farms on any time to respond. In fact, um, they the petition that the folks you're looking at, the petitioners put together is more than a hundred pages. And uh, I'll just give you a, a couple of um, screen grabs. Um, basically they're saying the district attorney had been repeatedly provided with information uh, about what they say are violations of law and cruel treatment of animals, despite knowing of these violations and the need for prompt action since 2018, the DA has failed to prosecute the violations. And um, what the uh, opposition's response is, is that Petitioner Shung, as well as Dane for Dogs, which is another petitioner, now urges court to bring criminal charges against Ridgeland Farmed in their petition. The court should deny the relief sought and close this matter, docketed as a John Doe proceeding for at least three reasons. One, the farm is statutorily exempt from prosecution for the alleged crimes. Two, even if they were not exempt, uh, Ridgeland Farms is already subject to federal and state inspections by state, uh, by agencies with enforcement authority, ensuring compliance with all applicable federal and state laws, making it improper for this court to provide an extraordinary check on the DA's decision not to charge. And three, to the extent that 
Uh, the matter is characterized as a John Doe proceeding. The alleged crimes are not among the statutorily enumerated offenses in which the procedure applies. There you go. We're going to take that out and we're going to just follow everybody in court uh, to where they're going. And um, there you are. There is Wayne Chung talking on the phone. We're going to hear from him in a couple of seconds, we hope. Joe Allman, uh, who is... Uh, our videographer on scene is standing by uh, very expertly getting all the action. And uh, Tiffany Brunelli, you're standing by as well. You are there. Uh, what is the mood in that county um, where Wayne, the man you're looking at, by the way, a former constitutional law professor, uh, was supposed to go on trial, charges are dropped, Instead of celebrating, uh, well, I'm not going to go to prison for 16 years, he was disappointed because he said he wanted the Beagles to have their day in court. So now he's going back to court, to the very same courthouse that he would probably be prosecuted in, I assume. I, I don't know that for sure, but I'm guessing. And uh, demanding that a special prosecutor be appointed. So, um, wow. Uh, what are your thoughts, Tiffany? Oh, this is so it, this is exciting he has the potential to save 3,000 beagles and i know we had a large response from locals who didn't even were glad to get the information they didn't even realize that this this facility is located in, the, in their own backyard and so um there was a large positive response while we were there and they're getting the information now and wayne has the potential 3,000 beagles he has the potential to save Wow. So, okay. Uh, Tiffany went there. She went all the way there to Madison to participate in a convergence that occurred because even after the uh, charges were dropped, uh, activists still converged on the area and um, were holding demonstrations like this. This is the outside of the Dane County Courthouse. Dane County is where Madison, Wisconsin is located. So you can see that there were uh, many, many uh, events and demonstrations around this case. And let's listen. Motion, Stefan spent a lot of time drafting this brief. We mocked up the argument a couple days ago because we thought we'd have to argue this. And this judge was, was smart enough and aware enough of the law to actually just basically predict what the argument was and predict what our outcome was, that, which is that Ridgeland is not allowed to be a part of the proceeding. The other thing is really interesting, if you, if you saw this, was I was fascinated. The district attorney of the entire county, the guy who runs yeah. the entire office, like has probably 100, 200 employees, I don't know exactly how many, and at least dozens of attorneys underneath him, who's sitting in the courtroom on Ridgeland's side, right next to Ridgeland's attorneys, and they walked out together. That was fascinating, interesting to me. And I, I went up to Mr. Ozan just out of respect for him because, I mean, we have said some negative things about the office, which I understand, but they also tried to throw me in prison. So he should understand that I'm going to say some negative things about them trying to throw me in prison for taking care of some dogs who are clearly being abused. And I went up to him afterwards and said, Mr. Ozan, is it a, can I have a moment of your time? And he said no, uh, which is pretty consistent with the way they've approached us over the last seven years. You know, they haven't had any meaningful conversations. They did have an investigator who's not an attorney, just an investigator, come and speak to us on a number of occasions when we had dozens of people with us. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of debating whether we should all make a stop on the third floor and visit the district attorney's office again, because it has been effective to have all these people there. They've been more responsive. On the other hand, I think if there's a lot of people there, he may be less willing to have a conversation. He may send out just another one of his employees to come perform for us rather than having a real conversation to the extent we can convince them to have a real conversation. Although, you know, at this point it almost doesn't matter because the district attorney is not a party of this proceeding. And, you know, I think we've made a very compelling case over the last seven years, or I guess technically it's six years since 2018. We did the rescue in April, 2017, but we published everything in May of 2018. So for the last six years, we've been trying and begging. And if you look at the petition, I mean, there's criminal complaint after criminal complaint. 2018, 2022, 2023, um, 2024, year after year, we've asked them even to look into this, even to have a conversation with us. And the best they've done is to have one of their investigators come out and basically tell us, oh, you know, we're not going to listen to anyone who doesn't have jurisdiction, which doesn't even make sense. Like, that's not the way evidence works, right? Oftentimes, it's not like if an ordinary citizen comes to you and says, my husband was murdered. The district attorney is going to say, well, I'm sorry, you don't have jurisdiction. You're not an officer, so I can't listen to you. It's like, well, no, you have evidence of crime that was committed. 
doesn't matter if you're not an officer with jurisdiction in this county. You have evidence that a crime was committed. You have, I mean, the district attorney is obligated, if they care about the rule of law, to listen to that, even if you're not an officer who's, you know, in the jurisdiction of the Dane County Sheriff's Office, right? It doesn't matter. So anyways, long story short, I, I mean, we'll probably talk to Kristen and Stefan and, and Rebecca and discuss whether we should stop by. I mean, I'll probably stop by personally, just as a courtesy, um, just because I, I, I just feel like when you're in these conflicts with people, sometimes a conversation does just help things. And I just really believe in the power of personal connections and conversations. So I'll probably try and talk to him, given that he's been so unwilling to talk to us and Dave for dogs too. I mean, it's not just us he's unwilling to talk to. Uh, but it, I'm inclined to say we shouldn't bring the entire group just because it might be seen as like performative and, you know, like, and also just will be like, well, I'm not going to talk to you in front of all these people. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but I'd be interested in other people's thoughts on that question. But today was good. I mean, I think oh, we're going to get an evidentiary hearing. We'll have one day. I think that should be enough. We'll have three witnesses. We'll play some videos. I think we'll have probably put the morning and evening session. So we'll probably have up to six, seven hours to have probably three witnesses. I mean, the three people we had signed declarations in support of this petition were me, Bonnie Clapper, and Tristan Rosenberg, an expert veterinarian. And I think it's more than sufficient to show probable cause. So, yeah, so that's where we are. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Wayne, can I ask you, for those who are watching live and don't really understand the nuances you went to court seeking a special prosecutor to prosecute this laboratory beagle breeding facility. What happened? So what happened today was the judge granted us the right to present all of our evidence at an evidentiary hearing and denied Bridgeland Farms the right to participate, which is appropriate. The judge also just noted that the district attorney of the entire county, the most powerful prosecutor and arguably the most powerful attorney in this entire county, was sitting in the courtroom and just asked him if he had any comment. And he said, no. And so it's, it was very unclear to us why he was there. This is the gentleman who prosecuted us for rescuing dogs from Ridgeland. He's a gentleman who has refused even a conversation with animal advocates about the routine and systematic abuse of dogs that has been unfolding for not just the last six years. I mean, we've reported it for the last six years, but the government of, of Wisconsin and of the United States of America has known about this abuse even going back to 2006. And we released a video this morning regarding USD inspections that occurred in 2006, 20 years ago, where a USD inspector found, and this is their own words, found dangerous and unsanitary conditions at Ridgeland Farms. The reports of burning animals, piles of burning dogs, and we've subsequently obtained documents showing that on an average year, there are probably at least hundreds of dogs that are just literally thrown into the garbage because they don't have any space, because their sex ratio is a little off, for whatever reason, they're literally just throwing dogs away. And for years, there's been no enforcement of these laws. And you have to ask yourselves, if, if we really live in a country that's a democracy, in a country where laws actually matter, what does it say when the most powerful corporations can routinely, year after year, violate the law? When the government's own inspectors even acknowledge the violations of law, abnormal behaviors in the dogs, dangerous housing conditions, conditions causing stereotypic behaviors, animals with uh, feet that are swollen and infected and injured from improper flooring that is allowing the animal's feet and, and, and legs to pass through the flooring. Uh, and then surgical mutilation of animals, which is not just a misdemeanor in the state of Wisconsin, but a felony. Um, so when, when you have overwhelming evidence of very serious violations of law, when this is being reported to the government over and over again, year after year, when it's quite clear if this were, and we have letters to support this from the Dane County Humane Society, from the Wisconsin Global Federated Humane Societies, if this were a nonprofit entity, if this were an ordinary citizen who was holding hundreds of dogs in cages where they had infected and swollen feet, where they were traumatized to the point they were spinning in a cage for hours, clearly there would be a prosecution or at least an investigation. And when that's not happening, we have to ask ourselves, are we actually living in a democracy where the laws matter? When just because you're powerful, just because you have political influence, just because you're making millions of dollars off of your activity, suddenly the laws don't matter? I mean, that, that is the fundamental question of this proceeding. And we will get an answer in the next couple of months. And, you know, this judge is known as a fair judge. This judge is known as a smart judge. You already showed that today, right? She didn't even have to hear our arguments. You already knew the right answer. And 
I was actually worried about this. Stefan was like, no, she has to do this. But I, I've had bad experiences for state courts. So I'm a little skeptical that judges will always follow the law, but this judge follow the law. Absolutely. Which is all we can ask for. So that's so, what happened today. Uh, the petition that uh, the response that uh, Rizum Farms uh, issued, this is just one quote. I'd like to get your response. And we invite Rizum Farms on at any time to uh, comment further. Rizum Farms, as a USDA licensed research facility, is statutorily exempt from the statutory provisions at issue. Well, I mean, do you want to take that one, Stephanie? Since you you are, you made the brief, right? You wrote the brief and you were going to make that argument today. What? So, so, yeah, so I think there's a couple reasons why that's not the case. So first of all, obviously what's going on at Ridgeland Farms is not what's covered by the statutory exemption. It's not research, teaching, experimentation. It's not incidental animal care. Uh, mutilating dogs, keeping dogs in cages that are so small that they're driven to psychosis. None of that counts as incidental animal care under even the broadest possible definition of that term. But it's also worth noting that Ridgeland Farms is not just a class R research facility under the USDA, but also a class A breeder. They have thousands of dogs who are not being used in research, who are simply being bred, grown, and then sold for profit. And so those are the dogs that this petition in particular focuses on that are under no possible construction of the statute covered by this exemption. Uh, the class A breeder dogs essentially at Ridgeland. So it's worth noting that Ridgeland is both a, a research facility where they're doing you know, horrific experiments on these dogs, but also just a breeder trying to make money by essentially raising dogs as commodities for sale. And I would also say that just because um, an entity or a person is regulated by the AWA, the Animal Welfare Act, does not mean that they can't be criminally liable for their crimes. Just like in any other situation, there are plenty of occupations where people are regulated by various agencies, caretakers of humans, all sorts of people are regulated by other agencies. That doesn't mean that they have carte blanche to break the law and commit crimes. Yeah, there's all sorts of labor regulations under OSHA, under state and federal law. Doesn't mean you can just kill your employees and put your employees in a cage and say, oh, sorry, we're a regulated entity. Department of Labor is the only agency that's allowed to, to investigate our misconduct, and they've said everything's fine. And we know the problem here is, and that is their argument. Their argument is part, well, this, the federal and state departments of agriculture are the entities that regulate us. We're totally fine. They say we're fine. And the reality is they don't say they're fine. Right? They're their own inspectors that they're not fine. But even if they did say they're fine, these agencies are captured by the industry. I mean, the, the head of the Department of Agriculture at the federal level is Tom Bilzak, the former governor of Iowa and the former president of the Dairy Export Council. And he was making a cool million dollars a year doing nothing, you know, for years, basically acting as a, a front person for the dairy industry. And, and Americans across all political perspectives are trying to understand how rigged the system often is against ordinary people, against vulnerable individuals. And certainly these dogs are among the most vulnerable individuals in this county. And again, if the rule of law actually matters, it has to be imposed not just on the powerless, not just on activists, on dogs, on ordinary citizens, but on the powerful. And that is the question that's going to be answered in this proceeding. Thank you. One last thing about the exemption. But in some ways, I actually think the fact that Ridgeland invoked this exemption is extremely clarifying. Yeah. And it's because they themselves believe that the laws do not apply to them. They yeah. said as much. They said, we're exempt. These laws don't apply to us. We don't have to contest any of these factual allegations because they just don't apply to us. That's false. I think the court sees that. I think the court will see that. And I think that's all the more reason the court has to take action because Ridgeland Farms, as I said, doesn't believe the law applies to it. And the DA has refused to take action. Cool. Anyone else have thoughts, questions? I have a question. Um, are the reports that come from the inspections, are those publicly available? Like, can we look those up? Yeah, if you go to my blog, uh, the most recent newsletter I published on the Simple Heart Substack has a link to the petition, and the petition itself has as an attachment these inspection reports. And I will just note, it's having looked at inspection reports for the last two decades of my life, it's very rare that inspectors find anything at all, right? Because these are inspections that happen very infrequently. Uh, usually what it's an accreditation agency might inspect a facility once or twice a year, and that's usually announced in public. And the USDA and state departments of agriculture might inspect once or twice a year. And there's actually been recent reporting showing that even though technically you're supposed to inspect every year under the Animal Welfare Act at the federal level, a lot of times what the USDA has been doing is just saying, oh, there's an accreditation agency that's already inspected this place. We don't actually have to do a real inspection. We'll just give you a phone call, shoot you an email, and, and they say things are fine, and we say things are fine, and, and there's no need for any follow-up. So it's very rare that you actually find anything when the inspections are that infrequent 
when there's this collaborative perspective, and especially under the Trump administration. Trump basically said, my policy for inspections, not just of animal abusing companies, but of oil companies, of coal companies, pretty much across the board, is we want to take a collaborative approach with the industry. And, and, and let me just point out, this is like the fox guarding the hen house. You can't collaborate with the individuals you're supposed to be investigating for potential misconduct. Those two perspectives are completely different. If you're an auditor or inspector who's trying to find violations of law and you say you're collaborating with the individuals who you supposedly are holding accountable to the law, that's never going to make sense. And that's exactly the way these inspections operate. And yet even in that paradigm, even in that paradigm, there have been multiple findings of legal violations, including things like abnormal behavior. And abnormal behavior is something that is specifically and explicitly set out in the Wisconsin animal cruelty statutes as a violation of law. Not just a violation of the regulations, not just a violation of the animal welfare standards set out by ALAC and the other accreditation agencies, but it's a violation of the criminal laws of the state of Wisconsin. And this has been found repeatedly at Ridgeland Farms, and yet there's been no action beyond, yeah, shoot us an email, let us know if you've done anything to change things, and, and usually that email is sufficient. You know, and that's, that's not sufficient, right? Especially when you're seeing a pattern over six years. And, and the reality is, I mean, it's just, it's just common sense. It, all of us who know dogs know that if you take a desperate, lonely dog and stuff her into a two-foot by four-foot cage for seven years, and there are dogs at Ridgeland who are still there in the same cages, probably, that we saw them in, in April of 2017. Seven years later, we know this because some of the dogs we rescued were seven years old and had been in a cage their entire life. If you can find an animal that should be spending time with their family, running around outside, exploring the environment they live in, in an eight square foot space, standing on wire their entire life, then guess what? A lot of them are going to go psychotic. A lot of them are going to go insane. And the same is true of human beings. As bad as solitary confinement is, this is not just solitary confinement. This is solitary confinement in a metal tomb. You live in effectively a metal tomb from the day you're born until the day you die at a place like Ridgeland Farms. And that's not okay. And I'm not saying that just morally. I'm saying legally that's not okay because when the housing conditions are leading to abnormal behaviors, that is an explicit violation of law that has been completely unaddressed by the state of Wisconsin over the last seven years. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know the history of the enforcement of the animal cruelty statute and whether it's usually used against individuals or if it's ever been used against a corporation. Yeah, we just did a FOIA request, or I should say an open records request. And, and actually, I mean, do you want to answer this, Stefan? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're still looking into it, and we only have some limited data. But so far, what we've seen is it's been primarily prosecutions of individuals. I think we've only seen pro prosecutions, prosecutions of individuals. individuals. Yeah. Um, and frankly, I mean, a lot of that conduct is also egregious, but it's not on the scale of what Ridgeland Farms is doing. It's often not as egregious as what Ridgeland Farms is doing. But just because they can afford to do it in secrecy, they've gotten away with it for so long. Yeah, the, there's no question if you look at undercover investigations, exposés, whistleblower accounts from various industries that most of the animal cruelty in this country is being driven by corporate greed, not by malicious individuals. I'm not, I'm not saying there aren't malicious individuals out there doing awful things, and those people should be held accountable to the law, in my view. Um, I'm not a big fan of incarceration, but I do think someone should at least say, like, hey, you can't do that. You know, kick your dog, stop kicking your dog. That's not cool. But... The reality is, when you look at the state of animals in Dane County, Wisconsin, and across the country, and, and Chris Sill, a professor at Harvard Law School, wrote a letter for us on this behalf, uh, on this point. Most of the cruelty in this country is being committed by corporations nowadays, because it's the corporations that are housing 3,000 dogs, 20,000 chickens, 100,000 pigs or cows. I mean, you know, like you have Circle Four Farms that has approximately 600,000 animals at one farm at any point in time in Utah. Uh, and and so if you're concerned about animal cruelty, it's really not the, you know, the kid who's got a dog chained up in their backyard as bad as it is. That's your main concern. Your main concern should be big corporations. And, and yet routinely we see not just in Wisconsin, but across the country, it is always the corporations that are exempted from the laws. In this case, frankly, if the exemption didn't exist, there would be far worse things we could talk about with Ridgeland. You know, we, we posted a video about this a couple of days ago, but Ridgeland apparently was working with a huge pharmaceutical company to inject rabies into dozens of dogs. And if you know. Uh, I would like to say that I have no independent confirmation of anything that's been said. We are live uh, outside 
the courtroom. Wayne Chung, who is a petitioner, is talking, and we invite Ridgeland Farms on at any time to respond to anything that's been said today. Uh, they did issue a petition in response, a legal document, and it said, among other things, petitioners, Hyung, and Dane for Dogs now urge this court to bring criminal charges against Ridgeland Farms in their petition for the filing of a criminal complaint. The court should deny the relief sought and close this matter, docketed as a John Doe proceeding for at least three reasons. One, Ridgeland Farms is statutorily exempt from prosecution for crimes alleged. Two, even if Ridgeland were not exempt, Ridgeland Farms is already subject to federal and state inspections by agencies with enforcement authority, ensuring compliance with all applicable federal and state laws, making it improper for this court to provide an extraordinary check on the district attorney's decision not to charge Ridgeland with any purported crime. And three, to the extent this matter is characterized as a John Doe proceeding, the alleged crimes are not among the statutorily enumerated offenses to which John Doe procedure applies. So uh, that is uh, the response of Ridgeland Farms, and we invite Ridgeland Farms, any representative on it, any time to comment on anything that is said today in open court or in the proceedings uh, during court or outside court uh, in live interviews, um, live statements being made by the petitioner and his attorneys. So let's go back and see what else is going on here. You can see a large group is gathered uh, asking questions of Wayne Chung and his uh, legal team. And uh, it looks like people are taking notes. So it looks like there's a lot of federal cases uh, that are taking notes. I don't know if they're working for major news organizations. Citizens don't have the right to look like reporters, but they could just be people. We don't have the same thing for the most part. Uh, Because a generalized grievance about the lack of enforcement doesn't create the, the sufficient injury. And the legal concept is a concept called standing. And if you ever hear this term, it's, that's what it means. It means, do you have an injury in fact? Do you have an injury that you personally received and you experienced that give you standing to bring a court case against an agency, a corporation, other than an individual for some violation of law? And there's a lot of cases for the last few decades that have held repeatedly that a generalized grievance about an agency or even a corporation not complying with the law is not sufficient. There has to be something unique. There are statutes that have been passed that create standing, and there's also some legal precedents that have created standing. And probably the most famous one that activists have used is a case called Havens. Um, And this is not an animal rights case, it's actually a Fair Housing Act case. But it was a a similar question where a bunch of people and activists and nonprofits out there were looking at housing discrimination and saying, we have all these landlords who are clearly being racist. I mean, there isn't a single non-white person in this entire building. They're denying every black or brown or or Asian person who applies for housing, and the government's not enforcing the law. They're not doing anything about it. And each of these individual tenants didn't have enough of a stake because, you know, the damage to them individually wasn't high enough that they'd be willing to hire a lawyer and break a class action lawsuit. Sometimes it was hard to find these people. And so what Havens did was it was it was largely a case about interpreting a particular statute, the Fair Housing Act, but the precedent and the analysis in Havens has been extended to other contexts. What Havens did is it created organizational standing for organizations whose mission it is to stop some violation of law or injustice. And in this case, it was housing nonprofits. You had these housing nonprofits saying, hey, our mission is to ensure people of color get housing. And we have all these landlords that are denying people of color housing just because of their race. They're harming us in a very unique way. And so we should have standing. And I was actually shocked by this case. (laughs) And I've been more shocked that a number of courts have actually allowed animal rights organizations to bring the same sort of legal action. But the argument is, if our mission is to stop a violation of law, and we can show that violation of law is occurring, we may have standing to bring suit either against the violator of the law, or in some cases, even the government, to force some sort of accountability. This proceeding is not a haven standing case. This is a petition for a special prosecutor, so it's unique. But the petition for a special prosecutor is another way you can try and force the enforcement of law when the government is asleep at the wheel. And you know, many of you know about the prosecutions of Donald Trump right now um, at the federal level. There's a special prosecutor in that case named Jack Smith. Different context there. It's not the lack of action by the government, but potential conflicts of interest. There's the appointment of a special prosecutor to prosecute Donald Trump because the concern <coughs> is given that the Department of Justice is being run by Joe Biden, if you have one of the Department of Justice's 
prosecutors pursuing an investigation of, of Donald Trump, it's going to be seen as potentially biased. And so they hire an independent prosecutor, appoint him and give him a budget and say, go at it. And we're making a similar argument in this case uh, that even if the district attorney were not asleep at the wheel, I mean, the fundamental problem is here is that they're just asleep at the wheel. But if they were not asleep at the wheel, there's a conflict of interest at this point because they've shown their hand, right? They, they went after us. When we came to them with evidence of animal cruelty, instead of investigating Ridgeland, they tried to put us in prison until they realized the public outcry would be so great they couldn't pursue the prosecution, which is why they dropped the case in Mark Jade. So did that answer your question? So it's, it's complicated, but there are some narrow ways that private citizens can try and ensure the government actually enforces the law. But I would say the most important way to enforce the law doesn't even happen in the courtroom. The most important way to ensure the law is enforced is for people to come out to court cases like this, because it is public pressure, it is the grassroots that, frankly, through time immemorial, since the beginning of this republic, right? The reason 1776 happened was because a number of people felt like the king was acting in arbitrary fashion, wasn't enforcing the law, and they revolted and said, this isn't okay. You know, we have the Magna Carta, we have basic rights we should have as, as citizens of, of the Commonwealth, uh, and those rights are not being enforced, so we're going to create a new democracy. I'm not saying we go that far. <laughs> Let's not revolt. Or at least, I mean, I don't think we should revolt. I think we can still reform the system. But it is fundamentally a question for the people when the law is not enforced. And it takes protest, it takes persuasion, it takes reporting, it takes dialogue, it takes all those different pieces to come together to ensure the laws are actually enforced to protect the most vulnerable individuals in our society. Do you, do you know how they, they were able to close through the bill? Uh, we do, and we've talked to the, a number of the people involved in that case, and those conversations will continue. But it, it was very similar to the dynamics of this case. I'll just say it's very similar to the dynamics that have been unfolding in this case. When you accuse a corporation of a violation of a state statute, and it's a corporate entity versus an individual, what is the hope for outcome that during the investigation itself will identify particular individuals that com com committed crimes, or is it something like an outcome where that business is no longer allowed to operate? Yeah, that can be one of the sanctions potentially. Um, so corporations obviously can't be in prison. <laughs> it's, it's a non-existent, it's a fictional entity. Uh, but there are fines, there's civil sanctions, and there, when, when a corporation is found guilty of a crime, for example, uh, there are many instances where the state and federal funding can no longer be provided to not just that corporation, but other, other entities involved in various transactions of that corporation. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and there are also just injunctive things we can do. And, and injunctive relief is basically relief that doesn't require punishment per se. It just requires the party upon which the injunction is imposed to change their behavior, right? And that is one form of relief that is available if there's a criminal prosecution of a corporation. And that's important because if there were an injunction imposed against one individual, right, who was performing cherry eye surgeries or putting dogs in cages inappropriately, well, once Bridgeland fires an individual, the injunction no longer has any binding effect. So the injunctive relief in a case like this in many ways is most important because what we'd like is a court order saying you cannot hold dogs in cages to the point they're going insane. You cannot use wire flooring where the dog's feet is dropping through the cage floor, getting trapped, and they're suffering from foot infections and injuries and lesions on their feet as a result. And you cannot perform surgical mutilations on these animals. And for us to say that to an individual is not gonna be nearly as effective as a corporation. Because again, most of the animal cruelty in this country is being inflicted by corporations. And so a lot of the prosecutions that are occurring just aren't sufficient to solve the problem because they're not going after the root of the problem, which is a corporation and not one bad individual. Um, one thing I would say about the movement here in like Wisconsin and like I'm from Minnesota originally, I have a very large conservative family in Minnesota. I couldn't agree with them on anything else except for this. Yes, wow. So it is something to be careful about how we talk about it because yeah. she even sent me 20 bucks for my poster. Wow. Um, and she would, I, I literally can't talk about anything political with her. Yeah, you're right. But. Um, yeah. She was outraged by this. Yeah, we shouldn't condemn Republicans as, as animal abusers because they're not. And there are a lot of them who are very supportive. And I'll give you an example. I mean, I just gave some implicit shade on Donald Trump. And I'm not his biggest fan. Sorry if any of you love him. I mean, I still love you, even if you love Donald Trump, but I'm not the biggest fan of our former president. Having said that, 
Lena Trump, his daughter, who's currently the chair of the RNC, is a huge animal rights supporter. Huge. Like she's done amazing. Uh, we as a nonprofit do not get into that kind of politics, but we can bring you up to date. This is an historic hearing. Wayne Shung and Dane for Dogs, uh, Madison, Wisconsin is in Dane County, have gone to court this morning and we were live inside the courtroom, which is also a first for Unchained TV, um, where they had a proceeding asking for a special prosecutor to prosecute the Laboratory Beagle Breeding Facility in the area. Wayne Shung himself had gone into this facility way back in 2019. Here are some still photos of um, some of the images he and two other uh, associates took as they rescued three dogs. They were charged with felony burglary and theft. It took seven years for the case to approach the trial date. And then just days before the trial was set to start, um, all charges were suddenly dropped. And uh, I guess the prosecutors and those involved thought that was the end of it, but maybe they didn't know Wayne Chung, who was pretty famous for getting arrested and getting prosecuted in order to make a point. Here he is getting arrested in California. Um, and his point is that he's willing to go to prison to expose um, what he feels is criminal animal cruelty. Uh, again, we invite Ridgeland Farms on at any time, and certainly we can't predict what anybody says in open court or speaking to a journalist and others outside court. But um, we have played numerous times the opposition's response, saying that there's many reasons why they feel this should be thrown out. However, the judge said, you're all going to be back in court on July 10th. So um, it proceeds, and at least for the time being. So that is a that is a victory uh, for uh, Wayne Shung uh, in the sense that the um, corporation said this should just be thrown out uh, immediately. Uh, that seems to be what they said in their petition. Again, they're invited on any time to respond. So uh, we'll go back here to um, the courthouse. He's outside court here. Here what he has to say. The dogs going psychotic, stuffed in cages all day and say, yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. And, I, I, I like the idea of having another rabies vaccine. We already have a rabies vaccine. Do we need a 13th rabies vaccine just to make Mark another few hundred million dollars? In so um, I want to go to, while we watch this, Tiffany, what are your thoughts as somebody who went all the way from Los Angeles to Madison, Wisconsin, to support the Beagles uh, who are in those cages? Jane, I am so excited. This sounds really, really good. Groundbreaking, history-making that they're gonna get a date to argue the case, over a hundred pages of evidence that he submitted to the court, Wayne. So it's very exciting, can change history and has the potential to save 3000 dogs. So I think this is great news and very excited. And why did you decide that you wanted to go all the way up there uh, to to support this effort from Los Angeles. I mean, you, you got in a car or plane and you just went there. Why? Yes, I originally planned to go to the hearing, which was dropped at the last minute. And as you said, Wayne was very disappointed that he wasn't going to be able to fight for these dogs and show, even though he was the defendant facing 16 years in prison, and um, that he wasn't going to be able to show the realities of what's going and expose what's going on with these dogs, the horrendous conditions that they live in and then sold for animal testing. So he wasn't going to just drop, drop it and let these dogs just languish and the abuse to continue. So even facing 16 years in prison, he was disappointed and they actually begged the judge to continue with the charges, which they can't do if they're dropped. So so it was very um, encouraging today. And I don't know if you noticed, but Ridgeland Farms didn't even argue any about any of the citations or the conditions of the dogs. Their main well, argument- Let's not get into the legal issues because you and I are not lawyers and we don't know yes. what the particular uh, uh, limitations of today's hearing were in terms of who was allowed to speak or who wasn't allowed to speak. But we do- uh, do take your point that uh, this is a very emotional issue. Every whose dogs was was just as deserving of life and freedom and a family. You know, I mean, all of us know if you have dogs, 
these are precious creatures and, and so beautiful and can give us so much joy and meaning in life. And to treat them as things to just literally throw into a landfill and burn. You know, that's not right. So let's change it. Thanks everyone for being here today. It's, it makes a huge difference to have the public support. It makes a huge difference. And you, cool. You're looking right oh, now at video of when Wayne Shung and two others went into Rizwin Farms back in 2017. The dog you see spinning at the bottom of the screen, I believe that's one of three dogs that they rescued. It was considered by the district attorney to be theft. Wayne Shung faced 16 years in prison. And then at the 11th hour, essentially, the case against him was dropped. They thought, well, they're done with it. They'll, they'll never see these folks again. But no, Wayne is back today. And uh, you just saw it here, historic moment in court. Um, and he is speaking up for these beagles. And uh, indeed, he told me, he said he was more nervous today than um, he was during his own trial because he felt like the fate of 3,000 or so beagles, however many beagles are in those facilities, uh, was at stake. So uh, he considers this a victory. Um, I know we've got uh, Joe Allman, who is uh, recording uh, all of this live. Uh, it's truly extraordinary. Uh, you know, uh, certainly um, the ability for, for example, us, Unchained TV, to do what major news organizations should be doing but aren't. I think this is a huge story. I think ever, I think CNN and NBC and ABC and CBS and you know Fox News, they should all be there today because this is historic. And um, they're not. So we are at Unchained TV. And I just urge you all, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, I would urge you all, please, to download our app. You can download it on your phone. Unchained TV, one word, just put it into your app store. You can download it on any TV. We're on all Samsung smart TVs, or if you have an Amazon Fire Stick, a Roku device, or an Apple TV device, you can uh, download it because we are, uh, our mission, and I was in mainstream media for 38 years, I saw how they're not covering these important stories the way they should be, is to do an end run around the mainstream media blackout and bring you this live coverage really historic. So let's listen in again. In many ways, they're, they're the most persuasive part of the petition. When I read through them, you know, and I skimmed them initially and I read through them again last night. I was like, this is extremely persuasive. I mean, just the collection of voices and the diversity of voices. And there are other people involved, like Murray did a really great job at helping us with the letters. Like I thought PCRM, uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, that was an extremely exhaustive and, and wonderful declaration just pointing out just it's interesting because that declaration wasn't actually really relevant legally to the question of whether there's probable cause because it, it wasn't about the conditions of the breeding facility but just implicit in all of this is this sense that we have to do this you know it's just it's a necessary evil right and this doctrine of necessary evil has been used to justify some of the worst atrocities in history and the pcrm declaration just does a wonderful job of undercutting that argument completely just pointing at how spurious, I mean, so many of the dogs originally are being sent off for toxicology testing for the dumbest things, like that are totally unnecessary, like new artificial sweeteners. Another rabies vaccine that is an RNA-based rabies vaccine that, you know, Merck can basically do people in a bind because it's, the current vaccine is, is, is not patented, it's a generic, so it's like they can't make any money off of it. So it's, it's really not about saving the lives, it's about making companies money. And, and PCRM's declaration does such a wonderful job of that. So. Anyways. Um, People want to read about that? Yeah, go go to my blog, The Simple Heart. Yeah, The Simple Heart. There's a blog, a newsletter with the title, The Special Prosecution of Ridgeland Farms. And the petition is linked. If you just click on petition in that blog, you can read the entire petition. Hey, Wayne, I have one quick question for you. you yeah, you're going to be back in court, my understanding, July 10th. Does that mean that this case is definitely going forward? Or does it just mean for the time being, you're getting the next step? We are getting the next step, which is an evidentiary hearing. And that's that's a huge victory because the judge could have been entitled today to just dismiss the case outright and say, I see nothing here that's even worth investigating. And the fact that we're getting an evidentiary hearing July 10th means we will play video in court. We will have people, including me, describe what we saw at Richland Farms. We will have documents that we've obtained from Richland Farms presented to the court. And the court will have to make what's called a probable cause determination. Is there sufficient evidence 
to suggest that a reasonable person could conclude that a crime has been committed by Ridgeland Farms. And I think the evidence is going to be overwhelming that on July 10th, probable cause has been found. Um, the, tough, the tough thing is, even if probable cause is found, the statute does not require the judge to appoint a special prosecutor and file a criminal complaint. It just permits the judge to do so. So there, there's a lot of discretion, and it's very uncertain because Wisconsin law doesn't really set out very clearly what factors the judge must consider, which is why the public support, the letters from significant experts, all these things are really important for us to mobilize in support of this petition because it's a very open-ended question as to whether the judge is going to appoint a special prosecutor. And, you know, so we have to use a very open-ended approach of persuasion in trying to convince her that there are grounds for doing this. If a special prosecutor were to be appointed, would that be historic? Would this be the first time in U.S. history that a special prosecutor has been appointed to investigate a corporation um, alleged animal cruelty? I think that's right. I, I mean, honestly, even a prosecution for animal cruelty of a corporation, they're extraordinarily rare. And um, my colleague in, in Stefan's uh, boss at the University of Denver, Justin Marceau, wrote a book, uh, I think published by the Harvard University Press, called Beyond Cages, which is largely about this, the fact that almost all the animal cruelty prosecutions tend to be of individuals who have little systemic power over the conditions that animals are being raised in. Well, the big corporations, the CEOs, the powerful entities that are actually driving so much of the cruelty are essentially inoculated from any sort of criminal accountability. And that's got to change. If you actually care about enforcing the law, if you care about animal cruelty, that's got to change. And, and this case will be an opportunity to do that. Wow. So it's historic. It is historic. It's historic. But it's not over yet. And my view is even the opportunity to get this evidence presented in court is, is going to be a huge victory because the courtroom is the place where the most important political and moral issues in our society are decided. And for really hundreds of years, animals have been denied their day in the court. This is one of the, the opportunities, the rare opportunities we'll have to present in a court of law the idea that animals are not just things for a corporation to use, they're living beings who have legal rights. And, and that will be the ultimate question that I think is answered on July 10th. So. So uh, there's been so many efforts to get legal personhood for animals. You know, the Non-Human Rights Project and others have fought uh, so far unsuccessfully. Is this kind of an end run around that? Well, if you can't get legal personhood for animals, let's take another legal approach. Yeah, one of the fundamental problems in our legal system is this, this lack of personhood, the lack of standing for animals. And so when an animal's hurt, injured, tortured, typically the only person to bring a claim legally on on that animal's behalf is the owner of the animal and the only way they can bring that claim is if they've lost some you know financial interest as a result of that injury so if your dog is killed in most states a court will only give you the cost of replacement you know that's and that's absurd it's ridiculous all of us know that losing a dog is a lot like losing a child I and mean, it's, it's devastating to people and if somebody kills your dog how can it possibly be it's just about the replacement cost of that dog the dog's not a chair the dog's not a table the dog is a, a unique sentient being who has a very unique special relationship to their family um, to the human species and and so this mechanism is a way for us to get around the the courts that historically have ignored that special relationship that human beings have with animals by, by identifying animals not as commodities, not even just as living beings, but as living beings who have rights in our society. And if the government isn't willing to acknowledge these animals' rights directly, then we will use indirect mechanisms to fight for their rights, including this petition. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Wayne, for taking the time. And we will stay on top of this. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, well, we will. St Are you going upstairs? Are you going upstairs to talk to? Uh, I think I'm going to go drop by the DA's office. Yeah, I just on an individual capacity. You know, I and I might not even share exactly the contents of that conversation. Like I, I, I want to have a real conversation with this guy and and hear his real concerns. I mean, it's going to be weird because this is a guy who, for the last three years of my life, has been trying to put me in prison. But I, you know, even even someone who's trying to put you in prison might have some good feedback. So I'm gonna, I'm going to talk to him. All right. Let us know yeah. how it goes. Thank you so much, Wayne Shun. Um, Thank you. Well, that wraps up our coverage here on Unchained TV again. Um, this was 
breaking news that we brought you, Wayne Chung in court. We're happy to say that Unchained TV was able to be live from inside a courtroom for the first time in our history, which something as a former broadcaster in mainstream media I did for many years. Uh, I filled in at Court TV. I had my own show on CNN Headline News where I covered crime and we would go into the courtroom live. But those are obviously major organizations. Um, our organization Unchained TV, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, by the way. You can find out more about it by just going to unchainedtv.com. And we urge you to download the app. Uh, is um, a growing streaming network. And we We're trying to do what the mainstream media does with hundreds of people and billions of dollars, but we do it um, with uh, just a couple of people and all volunteers. I'm a volunteer, Tiffany's a volunteer, and the other folks who work at Unchained TV are all volunteers using our skills and our knowledge to bring you these important stories that should be covered by mainstream media. And um, there might have been some reporters there, but I think all the major media should be there. Again, it is historic. And we do invite Richmond Farms on at any time to respond to anything that was said today uh, inside the courtroom or right outside the courtroom. We'd love to dialogue with you. Um, and, you know, uh, please support Unchained TV. We are uh, completely nonprofit and uh, we really rely on people who want to get this message out, uh, donating to us as well as downloading our app, which is completely 100% free. You can download it on your phone. Just go to Unchained TV and just put that in one word. You can download it on any Samsung TV. Behind me is a Samsung TV. There's a smart hub. You just put in Unchained TV. And if you have an Apple TV device, an Amazon Fire Stick or a Roku device, you can go on your TV and put it in. And of course, you can also watch online. So uh, it's really important that we build up our community to spread the word. And uh, so that's pretty much it. Final thoughts, uh, Tiffany? I'm so excited, Jane. Thank you for streaming from the courtroom. And I think this is groundbreaking. These beagles are going to have their day in court. And it's just, it's exciting. Thank you. I do feel like this is history in the making. I feel like we were part of an historic moment. When you look back in history, it's easy to see the turning point moments. Uh, but at those times, it's sometimes not as easy to see when it's real time in real progress. But this was a first and it was not a failure on the part of uh, Wayne Shung. They get to have their day in court coming up July 10th. We'll be live. Hopefully we'll be in the courtroom and um, we'll bring it to you. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next time on Unchained TV.